welcome back uh, for a great session we're going to have now called Hop on the SDG Train, Transport and Sustainable Development Goals. If you have questions from our online audience, please submit them via the YouTube chat and we will try and bring them into the room. Um, and for those in person, just prepare your questions for when we come to them uh, later on in the session. Uh, now to moderate this session, I'm delighted to introduce Rajiv Joshi, uh, founder and CEO of Bridging Ventures. He's also the lead author of the Decisive Decade, Organizing for Climate Action, and has been in recently involved in the launch of the Columbia Climate School um, here at COP26. Uh, so delighted to welcome Rajiv um, and his speakers to the stage. I need to go in the middle, I think. Good morning, everybody. Actually, it's good afternoon. How are you doing? Having a good time? Yeah. So we are on the 10th of November in COP26. Can you believe it? So much has happened. So many announcements. So many countries present. So many voices being heard inside, but so many voices waiting to be heard outside. This agenda is part of a wider agenda, and the climate goals are absolutely critical if we're to succeed in this decisive decade. We have to get to a point where we have global emissions by 2030 and do it in a fair and fast way. We're at a point now with less than four gigatons of CO2 to emit in the, in the atmosphere for a 60% chance of landing a 1.5 degree future. So how do we get there? Well, one of the key questions we have to ask is around the question of transport and mobility. One of the critical s segments of our economy and one of the critical areas of the Sustainable Development Goals. And we have an esteemed panel with us here this evening, um, this afternoon. We've, we've got with us many uh, dialing in online as well as those who are with us here in person. Um, so I'm just going to introduce some of those here online first, beginning first with the European Commissioner who is very kindly uh, joining us for the first part of our proceedings. Um, Adina Valian, um, Commissioner, please introduce yourself and just tell us briefly a little bit about why you are at COP26, um, the, the focus you have in terms of transport and mobility and your hope for COP26. Well, hello, everybody. I'm uh, Adina Valian. I'm Commissioner for Transport in uh, the European Commission. Um, I have a long standing towards uh, environmental issues. Uh, this time, I'm not in person at COP, but it doesn't mean I haven't been in uh, many of them. So I'm uh, quite familiar with proceedings and the talks, and my hopes are very high. Um, for this uh, COP26 to come up with uh, um, uh, true, uh, solid commitments uh, for our future. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Um, Florence Virgilin, thank you for joining us, Florence, as the Executive Vice President of Industry Marketing and Sustainability at the Salt Systems. Please tell us a little bit about yourself and perhaps tell us about what you, um, as an industry leader, feel are some of the opportunities from a transport and mobility perspective that we should be thinking about here at COP26 as we, as we challenge ourselves to look at how we might achieve a fair and fast transition. Yes, thank you very much, Raj, and a pleasure to be here with all of you today and with such a wonderful panel. Yes, I'm Florence, I'm Executive Vice President at Dassault System. And as a system, we are a software company, and we are basically 95% of all cars on the planet. So transportation is pretty big for us. And well, we also we also realized that, as you just say, there is an urgency. There is an urgency to act. If we want the global warming not to be higher than 1.5 degrees the world needs to be net zero by 2050, and this is a huge challenge. I was yesterday at an event where John Kerry was talking, and he was saying, if we want to solve that challenge, we need 
private sector, we need business at the table. And that's exactly why I am here, because we, as business leaders, want to be part of the solution. Of course, we already have committed SBTI and Net Zero, but as a tech company, we also want to provide solutions to other industry in order to help them become more sustainable. Thank you very much. And um, to our final speaker on the stage here, um, I'm very pleased to invite Barbara um, Rambusek to join us from the EBRD, European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, uh, also leading on gender and inclusion. Um, Barbara, please tell us a little bit about your work, but um, inclusion is an absolutely critical issue here at the COP. We've heard the voices of civil society, we've heard the voices of, of business leaders, we've heard the voices of, of many governments who feel that in some ways this COP hasn't delivered in that area. Do you want to share some of your perspectives around how we can better um, deliver on the promise of inclusion and leave no one behind? Thank you very much, and I'm really delighted to be here, particularly in such an illustrious panel uh, with very uh, impressive other speakers. Um, as you say, I think the focus on, on inclusion and basically on, on inequality, or actually promoting equality of opportunity and climate change, to bring those two areas together is vital. I think we cannot really sustainably tackle climate change unless we actually bring everybody on board, unless we create opportunities for everybody to take the difficult decisions that are required at the policy level, but to also change how we live and work and how we do business. We need everybody to have a stake in this. Um, and for that, we need to open up um, equal opportunities when it comes to green jobs and green skills, when it comes to access to infrastructure, access to finance, um, and, and really when it comes to reaping the opportunities that a green economy transition can bring. At EBRD, we are very focused on this nexus between inequality and green investments. Already half of our investments have a very specific focus on green. They are green investments. We have a commitment uh, to make sure that all of our investments will be Paris aligned by 2023. And um, also our focus on inequality and gender equality in particular is one of our strategic priorities. This year alone, we've actually substantially increased our focus on introducing a gender focus into our investments and now have a third of our investments uh, doing just that. So it's not an either or, there is not a trade-off. You can do green investments that also focus on equality and particularly gender equality. And indeed, I think this is imperative for a long-term sustainable solution. And do you see a number of the investments reaching people on the ground? How do you, do you see the EBRD delivering? Absolutely, we, we do that. So um, we have women in business credit lines that specifically focus on enabling women to um, have the skills, but also the access to finance to adopt green technologies and finance those technologies. Uh, that is a very tangible um, uh, type of impact that we achieve across many parts of Central Asia. Um, but we also work with our infrastructure investors to make sure that the infrastructure solutions are not only green, but also open up opportunities for everybody. Indeed, this week, actually today, our board just approved um, 2 billion euros of additional investments into our green cities programs. We work with 52 cities across many different parts of our region to make sure that the cities turn to green infrastructure, introduce green infrastructure measures, that all the investments that are coming have a specific focus on green, but also that the infrastructure is accessible to everybody, that there are specific um, uh, areas, measures taken to make sure that uh, women can participate, that uh, people with disabilities, uh, people in less uh, developed, more remote parts of the urban um, system can access those new infrastructure developments. Um, but also, very importantly, I think that women are part of the policy-making process, that they are around the table to, to actually take part and share in the decisions as they are taken. Thank you. Uh, on the streets this weekend, we had over 100,000 people standing together in solidarity. And in those discussions and in those marches, listening to activists, mm -hmm. to business leaders, to, to mothers and fathers, to children, young people, there seems to be a, a, a level of anxiety that the, the pledges and the commitments yeah. um, need to translate in real action. So thank you for giving us some specific yeah. examples um, around how some of these trillions of dollars of capital yeah. that are being, um, in Scot as, as a Scottish term to say, bandied around yeah. um, will actually meet uh, the needs of people on the ground. Now, policy is as important as capital to unlock the transition to a 
a, a low carbon economy to a net zero economy. Commissioner, I would love to hear some of your, um, your perspectives on how policy can play a role and what you're doing at the Commission and what you would like to see in the future to be able to accelerate this transition to ensure that we get access to um, net zero transport solutions to, to people all over the world and how you're thinking about it in Europe. Uh, thank you, Raj. Um, let's start with how important the transport sector is for the economy. It contributes 5% to the European GDP and employs 10 million people directly. In 2019, the EU27 exported 751 million tons of goods, worth about uh, 2,100 something billion of euros, and 70% of these goods were transported by sea. Uh, so we have to keep this in mind and when transport is uh, working, then it's a sign that the economy is functioning. But we need the transport system to keep doing what it uh, does, but to do it better in a more sustainable way. And this is why uh, in Brussels we have adopted a new mobility strategy one year ago. Because in Europe we want to see the sector thriving and leaping into the next generation world of mobility where um, a seamless multimodal travel is accessible and competitive for uh, all travels. We want to see freight transport making large economies of scale by fully digitalizing operations and procedures. We want to see a future mobility system with lower emission but higher growth, offering better and more connections for all regions and all modes. And we want industrial innovation to underpin our global leadership in manufacturing. <laughs> so this is our uh, mantra, and this is what our sustainable and smart mobility strategy is about. Uh, this strategy, in fact, is a roadmap uh, indicating the policy initiatives needed to get to our final destination. We presented the first uh, package of this political uh, uh, legislative initiatives in July focusing on sustainability. I don't know if you heard about uh, our Fit for 55 package. That means we are committed to reduce 55% to the emissions <laughs> by 2030. Uh, now from transport perspective, because we have several initiatives, but from transport perspective, we were proposing a new alternative fuels infrastructure regulations. Uh, which would foresee binding targets for um, the member states on the recharging and refueling points. And we hope that this will ensure that we have the infrastructure in place to run zero and low emission vehicles. For planes and ships, uh, we have refuel aviation and fuel you maritime, uh, two initiatives which we hope will help to build a long-term robust regulatory framework that drives the uptake of sustainable alternative fuels in these two sectors. As the proposals make their way through the uh, European Union legislative procedures, we are now finalizing the next package intended to push things even further. I will present next month a proposal to revise our guidelines for the trans-European transport network, so for infrastructure. It will uh, refocus efforts on completing the core of our multimodal infrastructure in transport by 2030, but also ensuring it is equipped for sustainable and smart transport and high-speed connectivity. I'm also looking forward to present changes to the intelligent transport system uh, legislation we have, a uh, directive, paving the way for fully connected, cooperative and automated mobility. So we need plans and targets, but to make them real, we also need funding. So the EU investment in decarbonizing transport are uh, the, uh, here for a long time already. Uh, in the last seven years, a huge chunk of the 100 billion in new funding for transport went to sustainability projects. Rail, for example, as one of our most sustainable transport modes, received a 16.3 billion in co-financing. 
And for the next seven years, so this is our uh, multi-annual financial uh, uh, framework, uh, we have this EU recovery and resilience facility, which doubles the EU funds available with almost 100 billion extra channeled through national recovery plans. And more than two thirds of these are going to be allocated to the greening of transport. Also, uh, all other EU funds benefiting transport must also earmark a large share of their budget for climate action. Uh, this investment is a real opportunity because investing in cleaner, greener and smarter transport will step up efficiency and respond to customers' uh, demand. We'll make our transport system fit for the future and lead the way, we hope, in innovative, game-changing, uh, technologies. So this is uh, um, a big glimpse uh, on our uh, strategy for um, decarbonizing transport and making uh, it uh, more sustainable, uh, resilient, and why not competitive uh, on a global um, stage. Thank you, Raj. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, we, we really do need the EU to lead the way on these agendas. Um, making such a critical component of the global economy and with citizens across the EU mobilizing, um, your leadership on this agenda is going to be absolutely critical. But one of the things we also noted, and, and I'm glad that Monica has been waiting pa patiently with us here, um, when Christiana Figueres and I and a few others put together the inquiry into the future of climate action in the decisive decade, was the role of philanthropy but also the role of philanthropy and, and other actors in working together to drive radical collaboration for systemic change. Um, as someone uh, who's been playing a critical role at Climate Works Foundation, working across philanthropy, but also working as a special advisor to the UN high level champions at COP26, looking at this issue, um, Monica, please share with us some of your, uh, your thoughts around what the current obstacles are, what's standing in the way of the progress we need to be making to be accelerating the race to zero and ensuring that it's also a race to resilience. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm actually connecting from, from the so-called blue zone. So that is the COP and today is transport day. So is the, the time is perfect. And I'd, I'd like to share some thoughts as a former uh, negotiator and now uh, where I have found my, my, my space, which is in, in campaigns, coalition buildings. And, and before I, I share with you what we are doing from the perspective of bringing coalitions together to accelerate the pace of this, um, you know, especially electrification of road transportation, um, I'd like to emphasize that I, I come from a country that already has renewable electricity. Nearly 100% of the electricity we use comes from non-fossil uh, sources, and that does something to your imagination because um, you do start asking why would you use gasoline and diesel when um, electricity can do the job. So my point is that given that so much is happening, you know, if I told you, you know, why I was late, there were some kids outside angry about fossil fuels. At the same time, we have technology that are getting cheaper and getting better. So going back to your point about the role of philanthropy, uh, this is the time to align around a shared vision. And one of the big, big ideas that we have to normalize, just as we normalize the fact that we don't smoke in planes, you know, we used to smoke in planes and that was normal and was legal. Now it's not normal and it's not legal. We really wholeheartedly need to emphasize that it is the time, it is, the right time to leave the internal combustion engine behind. That cannot be a taboo if we are serious about the Paris Agreement. And the way that um, has been very effective in terms of engaging citizens, consumers, mayors, investors, is around the fact that we can actually, uh, while, we elect, while we decarbonize electricity, we can accelerate the pace of electrification of road transportation. So, how do we organize a conversation when we have an automaker, an investor, a city mayor, a politician? Well, we have to organize it around dates. And what happened in Europe was really powerful, you know, by, by saying 
in the fit for 55 package by, by proposing that by 2035, uh, the sales of, uh, of vehicles will no longer use, you know, will, will not use uh, petrol and diesel and we're shifting to zero emissions. That is an organizing principle that is really, really at the core of a lot of the drive electric campaign, a lot of the, what happened this morning with the Glasgow Declaration on Zero Emission Vehicles. And to a large degree, is a conversation that is not just about transportation or mobility, it's an industrial signal. It's about telling manufacturers, we need to stop producing internal combustion engines and this cannot be taboo. It's about telling the mayors, and sometimes we don't have to tell the mayors, the mayors are telling our, us as citizens uh, I live in Amsterdam, for example, and I know that after 2030, there will not be petrol and diesel vehicles circulating there. So, so we have to take that organizing principle and say to investors, what are the questions you're asking to, to manufacturers? We also have to work really carefully with fleet owners so that there is demand. We have to work with the unions because we know that the transition will be tough, more tougher in some countries than in others. And we also have to be very, very good at creating a vision that is not just about cars, because we know that uh, there is a movement for active mobility, there is a movement for more mass transit. So it is very important for coalitions to be very good at presenting a vision, at presenting a strategy. And, and here's the, this is, this is the point that is exciting. Um, philanthropy is coming together around the idea that the time has come to do campaigns that have proper resources for advocates, for researchers, for everybody who is committed to this acceleration. So for example, um, in, the, in the case of Drive Electric, the target has been $1 billion for this work for the next five years. And only in the last 12 months, uh, all these foundations have been able to fundraise 50%. Uh, a few weeks ago, you may have heard we got 300 million from something, 300 million US dollars from something called uh, Project Audacious. So the, right now, in addition to the signals that are coming out of COP, uh, for example, this morning with the Glasgow Declaration on Zero Emission Vehicles, with the Declaration for Zero Emission uh, Trucks and Buses, with all that is happening around zero emissions, including e-bikes and including active mobility, what is really important is that we recognize that no stakeholder can do this alone. Governments cannot do this alone. Companies cannot do this alone. Activists cannot do this alone. Investors, and, and the list goes on and on. So what we really need to be excellent at is at understanding the levers of change, making sure we press these levers of change simultaneously and make sure that we do everything we can between now and 2025, 2026, uh, to, to make sure we get price parity in as many segments of road transportation as possible. And the campaign that we have been working on is very focused on, for example, uh, advancing the idea of zero emission buses, uh, sales of zero emission buses by 2030 uh, in key markets, 2035 for cars and vans, and 20. 40 for heavy tracking. So these organizing principles, plus the resources, plus the signals we're getting from champions in different sectors, uh, is allowing us to get um, a sense of momentum that we didn't have two or three years ago. So it's, it's actually from all the complications at COP, and I know there are many complications, I don't want to underestimate them. I can report that on road transportation, uh, we will get uh, very concrete news. So thank you. Thank you very much. Monica, thank you. Um, continuing the discussion. May I uh, rush for a, for a short sentence? Yes, please, yeah. before you have to leave us, Commissioner, please go ahead. Yeah, that's, uh, that's the, the, the thing, and I will have to apologize to your audience. But uh, um, listen, um, it's true what Monica was saying, that there is now a new focus on uh, zero emission vehicles. And uh, this is um, why we are preparing the infrastructure, because we have to break the chicken and egg dilemma 
should I buy an electric vehicle? Yeah, but I don't have the infrastructure. Would the infrastructure develop if there are not enough electric vehicles in the market? So uh, that's why we are proposing this alternative fuel uh, infrastructure regulation. And we are going to make uh, mandatory targets for everyone to deploy along our corridors the right infrastructure for recharging. And when I say the right infrastructure, this would mean also the, say, the right power and quality of charging and access to it to make it easy and to make easy for people to cross border and knowing that they will find that infrastructure there. And this is for public. And we do hope, and just a figure, and I will close with this one. For example, in 2020, the electric vehicle sales um, um, in, be, um, increased to 2 million in Europe. And this is just because we are talking and discussing about this future of um, uh, sustainable um, uh, mobility on road. And uh, as politicians, if we are giving um, the signal, then uh, we hope with uh, also investments uh, put forward by, on our side to have the market and uh, the consumer following. And I really apologize, Raja, to your uh, guests that I will have to leave, but uh, I wish you all the best and uh, we will follow from distance your uh, further discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Thank you for joining us. Now, you brought up a number of issues, uh, both Commissioner and Monica and, and our panelists. Just to pivot a little bit, um, Florence, you've played such a pivotal role working in companies and in the boardroom of companies like Peugeot, Air France. I remember, you know, as an activist going into uh, the annual conference of Airbus to speak about aviation fuel emissions with quite a deep level of skepticism, but actually then sitting with young engineers and seeing the progress they were making on net zero transportation and in some ways having a ray of hope. Um, tell me a little bit about, from your perspective, w what are the rays of hope that we can draw from what's happening in the transport sector? Um, given some of the glimmers that you get to see, um, given your unique position. Thank you, Raj. That's actually a very interesting question. And, well, working in the technology sector, I'm very optimistic. Why? Because digital is a very powerful lever, be it in aerospace, but also in train or in car, what, whatever mobility, digital is a big enabler. Why? Because if you work on the virtual twin of a plane, a boat, a car, you can basically do a lot of research and development. You can try a lot of scenarios, millions of scenarios in the virtual world with different material, different technology, different processes before deciding what you want to do in the real world. And if you can take the example of a car, well, if you use the virtual twin of a car, like the current car we have on the road, they're emitting approximately 26 tons of CO2 all over their full life cycle. If you optimize your virtual twin to using raw material, eco-design, eco-manufacturing, recycling by design, it cuts to five tons of CO2. And this is today's technology. It's available now. And that's what we can do. And now with some startups, but also big companies like Renault, we're working on going more, going towards net zero emission car. And we really do think that's going to happen in the next few years. But more than that, we think that the mobility challenge is not only about the car manufacturer or the plane manufacturer. And we are working at very interesting programs on the hydrogen plane, for example, with Airbus. The mobility challenge is a system challenge, as commissioner just said. Because at the end of the day, if you have a net zero car and a net zero plane, but a CO2 emitting airport, or a city with a lot of emission along the way on the infrastructure and a lot of emission in the building of the infrastructure, you won't solve the issue. We have to solve the issue as a system. And working at the virtual twin of a territory, optimizing everything on the territory, making sure that vehicles are adapted to the mobility service of the city and sharing mobility services, that we've got the dynamic and intelligent infrastructure in order to get the grid for electricity or hydrogen at the right time, at the right place, 
and basically design the city for citizen living. Well, you can do that when you have the digital twin of your city. We've done that with Singapore, for example. We are working with Indian city like Jaipur, and we think it's extremely powerful. We're seeing amazing results, and that's the reason why I'm optimistic, not only for the car industry, not only with, for the plane industry, the aerospace industry, but basically for the full system. I think that by using technology, we can make ma major breakthrough. Thank you. Um, and I'm glad you brought up some of those examples. As a, as a Scot, but also as an Indian Kenyan, I, you know, I, I feel that a lot of the discussions here are looking at how we might transition economies that are very advanced um, and for, for which there's high levels of capital at, uh, within the middle class to be able to make some of the transitions necessary, both in terms of electric vehicles. Um, but we're also in a moment in the world where um, the entire planet is recovering from a pandemic of epic proportions. Um, less than 5% of people in the global south have even been vaccinated. And in some ways, people are looking at this moment as, as, a, as a decade in which we need the equivalent of a global Marshall Plan to put the planet back on track, both in terms of the climate crisis, but the other, the other converging crises of inequality, as you've mentioned, the, the, the crises of, of, of the pandemic itself, um, the endemic and pervasive corruption that is happening in the system. Um, tell me a little bit, um, Barbara, uh, in terms of your perspective at EBRD and your work on inclusion, uh, but also your, your kind of hopes for how we can perhaps ensure that the agenda and the discussions that are happening here in Glasgow also perhaps are, are strengthening in the solidarity between countries and peoples as we think about the development model as a whole um, and how do we support countries that are not as far along the development trajectory to transition on a fair and fast pathway that is also uh, at a lower cost um, but also in, enables us to deal with in, the inequality and in some of the issues that you've described. Thank you very much. I think um, every crisis also opens opportunities. And I think every crisis, in a way, also opens eyes in terms of what is really important and what needs to be focused on. So if we look at um, the, the, the COVID pandemic, you know, it hit at a time where the world was already dealing with a large number of other challenges, as you mentioned. There's climate change, there's digitalization, which creates opportunities, but also challenges for many. Um, there, is, uh, there are huge regional disparities, urbanization, within city discrepancies, and so forth. So I think all of that was already happening, and we didn't really have um, solutions at, at that point. And then on top of that, COVID happened and, and, and hit us all um, very unexpectedly as well. And I think initially, um, what, I, what I could see was that the responses were very often, just to go back to basics, I was told, oh, you know, we can do gender in two years, you know, when, when the crisis is over, but now we have to deal with the pandemic. But then very soon there was a realization, actually, no, that's not how it works. This crisis, this pandemic, actually opens opportunities to do things differently. And in a way, to, to use that phrase that I know has been overused in many senses, but to build back better and, and to really reimagine and redevelop how we do business, including on, on infrastructure, how we design infrastructure, how we invest and finance infrastructure, um, and that we can do, uh, uh, combine a focus, for example, on, on green and clean infrastructure with a focus on, on, on inequality and, and gender equality. Um, and, um, but also looking at um, regional discrepancies, looking at just transition, where regions are transitioning away from, could it be fossil fuels, um, could it be because of uh, global changes in, in value chains or other regions or other reasons, and, and how we can support those regions, including through better, cleaner infrastructure. So I think it's about combining these, all these, these um, areas in a sensible way. And, and, and I think the realization really, and this is what gives me hope, uh, is that we have come to the conclusion that it is possible. And we now really see quite a lot of examples of where on the ground, through investment, through finance, but also through policy and activism and, and partnerships, we can actually achieve that change on the ground in a credible way. Thank you very much. Monica, um, before we close out the panel, um, a number of commentators on this agenda believe that one of the biggest challenges to both development and to, to, to addressing the climate crisis is, is the friction cost, the, the corruption, the governance challenges that we face. Um, as a distinguished fellow at Climate Works, 
and someone who's, who's also deep inside of the, the UN system in this moment um, in the negotiations, how do you think we can strengthen governance to support the types of infrastructure development um, challenges that we're trying to, to meet in this 2030 agenda? Well, that's a, that's a huge question, and I would love to have a, a deeper conversation, and I hope we meet in person and, and have it. Um, I'll give you the shorter answer, because I'm sure that there are other panels. One, one of the things that I've been reflecting on, especially because it's just so difficult to interact with so many stakeholders here, and everybody has a sense of uh, failed expectations, is that if we are going to, to choose to be in this debate about climate, transformation, equality, you know, solidarity, all these very, very heavy words and ideas, we are going to be, we are going to have to be very unapologetic about rejecting black and white thinking. So for example, um, coming from a small country, and you, you know Cristiana, you know we in Costa Rica uh, like to punch above our weight. Um, I've always challenged, for example, the idea of big important countries uh, versus the small countries, you know, are weak and, and are idea takers. So, you know, I, for example, challenge the, the notion that only the, the, G20, the G20 countries matter. Well, they do matter, and at the same time, we know there is power in, in building coalitions, you know, much of what is going on right now, the pressure to change comes from small island states. So there is power when you challenge the big versus small and you get a big country and a small a country to collaborate. North versus South. I always rejected that, always. Because for example, um, you have countries that have more affinity and they are not in the same block. Right now, for example, today, the Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance is being launched. If you, if you don't know about it, it's out there, BOGA, Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance, and it's launched by Denmark in Costa Rica. You know, technically speaking, uh, north and south inside these walls are all at war, right? Or you have the whole discussion about, in, in my case, is, is a discussion that is very common in my life, between cars and bikes. It's all, you know, the future that doesn't have cars is all about bikes. It's like, why do we have to be so binary in every single discussion that we encounter? So my point is that when it comes to the complications that we see because of, you know, developing countries having to, to deal with COVID, deal with climate, deal with the fact that uh, that is difficult right now to, to make progress on, on, on economic terms, we are going to have to be very, very good at having clarity about what is it that we're trying to achieve. So in, in the case of transportation, we know we have to electrify faster every sector that we can. And at the same time, be very, very good at looking at our blind spots so that we don't end up with a black and white picture, which I hear a lot of in the case of electrification. Uh, it's very common for me to walk into a panel and be thrown at me the notion that what I'm doing is only going to hurt the South because all the ICE cars, the internal combustion engine, the petrol and diesel cars and buses and trucks are all going to end up in Latin America and Africa and Asia. Why do we have to be slaves of this black and white framing of this discussion? And I, I challenge a lot of people because, for example, how, do, how many of you know that already Chile has banned the sales of petrol and diesel cars by 2035, you know, same year as Europe. Right now, we have Bogotá, starting in 2022, they will only buy zero emission buses. And, and last year, uh, the largest metropolitan uh, fleet of, of electric buses was not in the US, it was not in Canada, it was in Santiago de Chile. So my invitation is that because we're so overwhelmed, because there is so much anger in, in, the, in the space, you know, women get, get really heated very quickly. People are, uh, are very, and, and it's understandable, my, my plea is to be the ones who are going to build coalitions and have a clear sense of what brings the coalition together so that we get the, the task done and be very mindful that we have to combine acceleration objectives, electrification, 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 and be, be very aware that 
there are a lot of very legitimate concerns about inequality, principles of solidarity have to come forward, and at the same time, uh, we have to be very good at understanding that, um, you know, youth want us to, to do things differently. So, so I, I don't want to end up with, um, with a sense that I am, quote unquote, optimistic. Uh, I'd like to choose a, a different word very carefully. I feel energized. I, I do think there is a lot going on that we will take from here and we will translate it into politics and economics that, that will allow us to, to at least in, in countries, that, in cities that can go faster, we will allow um, citizens to see that this is happening on the ground. Thank you so much, Monica. Thank you. Um, 30 seconds from each of our panelists. What is it that you hope to take away um, from this COP that you want to take forward in your own work uh, to accelerate this transition and help us as we meet this 2030 agenda and hop on the SDG train? Well, uh, for me, it's technology helping the world become, becoming more sustainable and basically reaching the 1.5 degree because, well, there is an urgency to act. And as a technology leader, I want to lead the way and embark as many other technology leaders with us to get as much as we can to the world and to the industries. For me, it's very much um, marrying a focus on green investments with a focus on bringing everybody, bringing people along. It's, it's about really creating opportunities for people um, and building that into how we do business rather than having it as an add-on. This, this has to be part of the core business model. Moni, one line from you. For me, the main thing is to make sure that we start talking about zero emission mobility so that we don't get caught up into incremental, uh, incremental solutions. We go the whole nine yards and we say transportation without tailpipes is possible, is, do is doable, and, and, and it makes economic sense. Well, we've covered a lot of ground in this panel. We've discussed technology, we've discussed policy, we've discussed finance, many of the key levers that need to be pulled, recognizing that those levers need to be contextually relevant, um, understanding that the development circumstances are, are different in different parts of the world, but at the same time, um, there's a role for all actors to play in this decisive decade. Um, we've also been talking about this panel, is, is the topic is on hop hopping on the SDG train. And if you look at the arc of action that is ahead of us between now and 2030, we're about to go into a major year in 2022 where not just the um, climate agenda will appear again in Egypt in COP27, but we'll also have um, nature as a major agenda item with the Kunming meetings having been moved in the CBD COP on biodiversity um, and nature. We'll also be uh, having Rio plus 30. It's 30 years since the very first meetings in, in Rio were the framework conventions on climate change, desertification, and many other topics, including by the biodiversity, were first created. Um, and therefore, the progress that the world needs to demonstrate is really going to increase in terms of accountability. And then finally, it's halfway to the, the year in which we agreed the Sustainable Development Goals. And therefore, if we look at this arc of action, there's significant pressure, I think, upon all of us to demonstrate progress, demonstrate that the meetings here in Glasgow um, are delivering for people and that they are delivering for the planet. And as you can see, we've got some great leaders, some great feminine energy here in Glasgow, which we need to mobilize um, all over the world. And uh, it's been a pleasure and a privilege to mobilize this panel. Um, there's lots of stories coming out of the COP I'm hearing about the Jamaicans launching tonight a race for life because they believe it's not just about a race to zero, but actually a race that goes beyond zero and a race that also protects people and planet, uh, working with fishing communities. Uh, so many different events, so many stories. Um, and thank you to the New York Times who are helping to capture these stories and uh, enable us to, to really spread those around the world and inspire people with sparks of hope that will enable us to keep going in this decisive decade collaborating together, together and holding hands in solidarity because while we can continue to throw stones at each other at moments when we need to hold each other accountable and we have seen some things happening on the streets, 
we, we don't have time to continue in a way that doesn't build the solidarity needed in this decade. And so we really need to start, start to find new radical ways of working together. And uh, hopefully some of the groups that are here in Glasgow can help to, to manifest that and demonstrate that uh, in these years ahead as we deliver on this agenda. Thank you to our audience for listening and for giving us so much of your presence here. We very much appreciate it. Namaste, thank you, goodbye from Glasgow.